Hello and welcome to Tech for Non-Techies, the only podcast that demystifies the fast-growing technology sector. I'm your host, Sophia Madriega, Chicago Beef MBA and tech entrepreneur. My aim here is to give you the skills, knowledge and confidence to find opportunities in the tech sector, whether that's through founding a company, getting a dream job or bringing a fresh perspective to your work. Hello, smart people. How are you today? I've spent a glorious weekend starting in Saint-Tropez and then finishing in Nice. And now I am back to the peace and quiet of the tiny French Riviera town where I've been spending most of my summer. And one of the best things about actually running this podcast is that I get to speak to you, my dear smart listener. And I also get to speak to really interesting people and stay on top of tech trends and business trends even though I've actually spent the last two months in the Côte d'Azur, not in corporate America. And today you're going to hear from somebody you might have seen if you would have gone to one of the big corporate conferences in the US or in the UK. His name is Andrew Grill. Andrew started his career as an engineer and he worked in various tech companies, including at IBM. And today he spends most of his time doing keynote speeches on tech trends and hosting his own podcast, The Actionable Futurist. And the reason I wanted to bring Andrew to you today is that I know that as smart and ambitious people, you go to conferences and talks quite a lot. And at these events, I found that you often hear talks on general trends, but then when you get back to work, you think, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with that? And I think especially speakers on crypto and the metaverse are really guilty of this because they tell us, oh yeah, the metaverse is changing the world. And then you're like, okay, how, what am I supposed to do with this? Andrew is not one of those people. He does not speak in random generalizations and I'm not one of those people. And that's why I wanted to welcome Andrew to Tech for Non-Techies. I think you are the first ever futurist I have ever had on Tech for Non-Techies. And so I just want to begin by asking, what is a futurist? It's a really good question. There are a number of ways to answer this. I'll give you some variations. First of all, it's a great conversation starter. When people ask me at an event or a party, what do you do? I say I'm a futurist. And it literally stops them in the tracks because like you, not many people have met a futurist. It could also be a made-up title. I spoke to a group of sixth form students, sort of 17, 18 year olds a few weeks ago, and my opening line was, yeah, this sounds like a bit of a made up title, doesn't it? Because you can call yourself a futurist. In fact, many people call themselves futurist. So if we look at the the actual definition, it's someone that sees into the near, mid or long term future. We can think of um, contemporaries such as Nostradamus, who predicted all sorts of things. Um, More near term futurist Arthur C. Clarke, who famously predicted that we would one day be using satellites. And I suppose more recently, I got really interested in Arthur C. Clarke's work, not only because he, with Stanley Kubrick, co-wrote 2001 Space Oddity, But in 1974, there's a video on the internet, actually with an Australian journalist. And the journalist said, look, uh, in in the year 2001, my son will be my age, so what will technology be like in 2001? And in 1974, standing in a a computer room full of wearing lights and tape reels, he essentially predicted the internet. He says we'll be able to work away from our offices, we'll be able to communicate with a small device, we won't have to you know, meet all the time. So he really was a visionary. The, the challenge, though, and the challenge I face by calling myself a futurist is everyone thinks that I'm going to think of things in 50 years' time. Now, when we start to commercialise futurism, a lot of my clients haven't got 50 years to wait to understand what's going to happen. They want to know now. They want to close the quarter. They want to plan for next year. So I style myself as the actionable futurist. And then you might say, well, what is that? And it is what it says on the tin. I provide near-term, actionable, practical advice. Uh, I normally leave my podcast guests or my audience with a shopping list of three or five things to do today. And it's very um, apt that we're talking about non-techies because I am a techie, but I spend my life explaining these concepts to non-techies and generally my audience are the C-suite and they don't always have the same level of understanding as I do. So I've had to learn over the years to translate my technical knowledge into something that 
any audience can understand. And my leveller is my 79-year-old mum in Adelaide, Australia. In fact, on my podcast, quite often she gets a shout out. I say to my guests talking about artificial general intelligence, it's like, okay, can you explain this to my mum? And if I can explain to my mum and she can listen to the podcast and understand it, then I've done my job. Excellent. And actually, while we've got, uh, well, we're on the topic of the podcast, what is it called? My podcast is, drumroll please, the Actionable Futures Podcast. I've got the brand in the name there. It does well for SEO. But again, it does what it says. It's on the tin. It looks at the near-term future with things that people should know about and things that will help them in their business life. And when you mentioned that you studied engineering, but I also saw you've got a degree in business. Uh, so could you tell me about your journey? So how you, know, you studied engineering, what attracted you to it? But then, how did your career pan out that now you are a futurist with a podcast? So I've got an interesting career. I'm a techie. I studied engineering. I did uh, a Bachelor of Engineering degree. I then converted that into a Master of Engineering, which bolted on some business subjects. I then did an MBA and found out that I really liked marketing. Now, generally, it's easier, I think, for engineers to become marketers or business leaders. It's not as easy for someone who studied marketing or the softer sciences to then go into technology. So I've always been curious about technology. Very lucky that my father owned a technology company, uh, a, a company that sold co- electronic components. For, so from a very young age, I was playing with those, you know, thousand and one electronic kits and being very curious and trying to understand how they worked. But when I uh, did my engineering degree, I then uh, did some work for a couple of the telecommunications companies in Australia. I realized that to be an effective technologist, you also had to have a very strong appreciation of business. And I think the two can work together hand in hand. We'll probably talk about how technology roles will emerge a bit later in the podcast. So I'm a bit of a hybrid where I have a deep technical understanding. I'm an absolute geek. I, I am actually the 24-7 24-7 tech support for about 10 different friends and family members around the world. When something breaks, um, I call myself Andrew as a service. So uh, I often get uh, crazy WhatsApp for things not working. So I have uh, an ongoing understanding of technology. But I worked out that if I could explain it to a business audience, I could be more and more effective. Good example. I was working for Optus Communications in Australia. I was running a project for some technology called ATM and Frame Relay. ATM is not automatic telemachine. It's asynchronous transfer mode. We, we don't hear about it anymore. It's essentially high-speed data between cities. And we had to get a business case approved through senior management at Optus, a 45 maybe $49 million business case. In order to do that, the, the standard technical skills that I had wouldn't have worked. I had to explain what the market um, uh, the, the market appetite was, how we're going to get it to market, you know, how we would brand it, all those sorts of things. And so I needed to pull upon my business skills as well as my technology skills. And actually, while we were rolling that project out from a company called Newbridge Networks, who no longer exist, a few people there tried to pull the wool over my eyes and told me that something wasn't possible. And when I gave them my credentials, I said, you realize I'm not just a product development manager. I'm actually an engineer. They went, oh, no, you actually know what you're talking about. But at that moment, the peer sort of level happened and we were able to talk tech to tech. And then it was a really, really good project. So long winded answer to your question, started as an engineer, got really excited and interested in marketing. But I've remained uh, active and curious as a technologist all my career. So... I really want to understand how that works in practice because technology changes so quickly. And obviously, you're also studying a different form of engineering than, say, software. Um, So how can you stay in touch, really, as a technologist with what's going on in technology because it's changing so fast and also because, as as far as I understand, it wasn't software engineering that you were studying? Well, it was engineering, which had a software component. So I was coding on Z80 assemblers way back when you actually had a hex keyboard and you had to literally type the code line by line. That's real world engineering. I'm not sure we do a lot of that these days. Go back to engineering. Engineers do things from what we call first principles. So if something is broken, we basically go back to the very first stage. And why is that broken? Is it plugged in? There's a show here in the UK called The IT Crowd. And the famous catchphrase is, have you tried turning it on and off again? And that may sound very twee, but often when you turn something on and off, you reset everything and it can actually work again. So we learned to go back to first principles. 
And so I've had a mantra for a number of years that is to get digital, you need to be digital. And by that, I mean to understand this technology, you need to play with it. So I have a commercial grade Wi-Fi network here in my flat. I have IoT devices. The lights lighting me are Wi-Fi controlled. I play with these things so that when I talk to my clients, I'm doing it from a position of authority. So how do I stay up to date? I read everything I can. I have so many news feeds. My podcast is actually a great way to learn. Every week, I've got a different guest. Sometimes three times a week, I'm recording a podcast. Everything from cybersecurity to quantum computing. These are the world-leading experts, and I'm humble that they've wanted to come onto my show to talk about it. But guess what? I'm getting a masterclass every time I speak to them. So I'm staying up to date. When I'm on stage in front of a client or writing a, an article or doing a podcast, I'm calling on that information I've learned. Because I have the technical background and understanding, any new piece of technology thrown at me, I can just build on the understanding that I've got. Uh, I'm not an expert in any one technology. I'm a generalist. I know a lot about a little or a little about a lot, whichever way you look at it. Um, and the challenge is I've got to be weeks, if not months, ahead of my audience, ahead of my clients so that I can really advise them. What is an NFT? Should you be involved in cryptocurrency? What is IoT? And when I say that, I say that from a position of authority because I've actually done it. Uh, years ago, when I was in my engineering career, I was literally on the back of a railway car as it was shunted by a train to simulate a rail shunt. And we, we broke components to see how they would, uh, well, would fail. And if ever you buy a bit of equipment and it says, what are the temperature ranges on the back? Someone like me actually went into a 100 degree environment uh, dripping with sweat and, and, and humidity to measure whether these components would fail. So I've done the real world engineering. I've done the hard yards. So I actually understand how this stuff works. Um, so to answer your question, how do I stay up to date? I read as much as I can. I play with the equipment. I buy the new tech and I cheekily source the world's leading experts to come onto the podcast. And so what are your clients now most asking you about? So what are other particular trends or topics? Like, for example, I was at the can lines recently and everybody was talking about the metaverse. But there was also this idea that there was a lot of talk, but I'm not sure how many people are really ready for action. And I'm also seriously doubting whether consumers are there yet. Um, so what topics? Is it the metaverse? Is it crypto? Or, or is it actually just more really simple stuff, you know, some people are still not collecting data properly or just, you know, have terrible onboarding. It's everything in between. So in a couple of weeks, I'm actually speaking to a group of recruiters about the metaverse and Web3. They're interested in what it might mean, what it might mean for their industry. But more importantly, I think people get hoodwinked a lot. And I'm sure it can lie all these phrases were bandied around. How do you filter out to say, is this something we should worry about and invest in now? Is this a hold or is this just too far away? And so I remain, with these new technologies, a skeptic. So I'm a skeptic around NFTs. I'm a skeptic around cryptocurrency in that I want to understand how it works. I'll give you a good example. Probably six or seven years ago, I was at a Christmas party in London. I sat next to a young gentleman. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a cryptocurrency uh, Bitcoin expert. I said, this is your lucky evening. I'm going to pump you full of so many questions that I've wanted to ask someone like you all about this. And a couple of things that stood out. He said, you know, the global transaction speed for Bitcoin is just seven. That's zero seven transactions per second. Compare that with Visa and MasterCard, about 65,000. And I thought, wow, I've really got to delve into this because I keep hearing that it's the future. But if you know that the transaction speed is so, so low, first of all, I want to understand why, and I do. But then I can cut through the hype. The other thing is the amount of energy required to mine or process one Bitcoin transaction is the same amount of energy required for 1.2 million Visa transactions. So it's massively, massively um, ineffective and unsustainable. So when you hear those things, you think, well, am I going to jump into this or am I going to understand it? Now, people listening to this podcast might go, Andrew, you're an idiot. You should have been in crypto years ago. You would have been a billionaire. Well, maybe so, but remember, I'm an actionable futurist. What can you actually do with it now, tomorrow, next week? Um, so in terms of what people ask me, it's, it's everything from what I think is completely simple and obvious through to what's Web3 about and everywhere in between. And that's why, as an actionable futurist, I've got to know enough about this to be credible and curious. 
uh, my company, with the support of the University of Chicago, looked into how the largest companies in the world approach innovation. So what we did is we literally spoke to heads of innovation at some of the world's largest companies on the basis of anonymity. Then we collaborated. Then basically we looked at all that research, saw some patterns, and we released a report, which actually you can get on the Techno Techies website. But one of the things that we noticed is the amount of innovation theater that went on. And it doesn't, you know, there are companies that are genuinely innovating. You know, innovation doesn't necessarily mean, you know, software technology. Like I remember we spoke to a company which was one of the leading FMCG brands. And they were saying, well, our consumers now want more vegan options, which means we have to make sure that our snack bars now taste just as good, but just with different ingredients. So that's really where we're focused on our innovation. So I did see some real examples of innovation, but also I saw examples of, well, we're going to get an expert like Andrew in. He is going to say all of these really smart things. We're then going to nod, and then we're going to go back and do nothing. Does that happen? How often does that happen? What do you think of it? Over to you. I just remind as you were speaking, I remember being on stage at a, an event probably 2017. It was the ICMIF, the International Corporation of, it was basically insurance group of people. And I talked about how groups like them might go to a study tour, go to the West Coast, look at what Google and Facebook and Twitter are doing. And as you said, go, we're going to be a tech company. We're going to be innovative and go back to the status quo. The other thing I see happening is they hire an innovation chief, head of innovation, and he or she sits in the glass wall on the ground floor. You write it some theatre. They put some, uh, some millennials in there and they have the flashing lights. But it's never integrated back into the company. So what you actually have to do is, yes, you need a centre of excellence, but the centre of excellence then needs to go back and infect, and I use that word deliberately, infect the rest of the organisation. So if you have, let's say, 30 people in your innovation team in that cube, eventually they go back into the business and they sit next to the business and they go... We're going to help you with digital transformation because what you're doing with your snack bars is hard, but how can you actually do rapid innovation? Have you thought about doing something in an agile way? Have you thought about running stand-up meetings for your product council? I thought that was just for the techies. No, no, no. You can run agile for your whole – you can run the board as an agile way. The example I always give, Queen Victoria ran her household weekly meetings standing up. Why? They lasted 15 minutes. There was nowhere to sit down. You had to deliver what you were doing, what you needed help with, what you were doing next, and then got on with it. And when I give that example, in fact, I'll give you another example. I was in Barcelona a couple of years ago in a startup environment. It was a fashion startup, and my client, I won't say who they, who they are, but they're into, into fashion. And as I looked out of the corner of my eye, there was a scrum meeting happening, and I, I said to the team assembled, what's happening over there? I don't know, people standing around having a chat? No, no. That's a 15-minute stand-up scrum meeting. And then they'll go back to what they're doing. And I said, how many of you run meetings in an agile way? I said, oh, our meetings take two or three hours. Well, there's your problem. How can you innovate if you're always talking about it? And then people then talk about, we're saying we were agile. And I say, well, who gets to make decisions? Oh, there's a whole formula. No, 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 no. If the team gets to make decisions, then they're running true agile. So to your point, there's a lot of innovation theater. There's a lot of being digital but not doing, a lot of being um, agile, not doing agile. I've actually noticed um, I was working in a, a co-working space, you know, before the pandemic when that was, a, when more of us were doing that. So my company and that was, was a thing, yeah. Through, yeah, in a really cool uh, co-working space in Shoreditch, obviously. And um, we were sharing space with, well, there were a few corporates that had their innovation teams there. And, you know, and I remember thinking, well, there was one particular corporate that was really not known for being remotely innovative. And I was thinking, well, what are they doing here? It seems to be, you know, a bunch of really boring people. Maybe they're delightful people, but they're, if they're within such great constraints, you know, putting them in jeans and in a funky area of London is not really going to help. I wonder if with the pandemic, this kind of fashion, fashion is going to change. I have no idea. Um, but we also, in that report that we authored last year, we really did also see that some heads of innovation or heads of the digital strategy, they just weren't empowered. So we saw that sometimes, just as you said, that person gets hired because the, because the board says, the board says, okay, we're really screwed on digital, you know, our competitors 
are taking our consumers away. We need to have a much more sensible digital strategy. So they hire some person and then nobody listens to what that person says or basically then that strategy, that person ends up failing not because they, not for the lack of trying. And when you see things like this happen, Andrew, what do you suggest to that company? When, when you, they already hired that person, but they haven't empowered them. But we've still got time to rescue. What do you say to that company? I talk about another form of diversity, digital diversity. Do you have people who understand all these things on the board, on your management team, so that rather than someone who is not a board member um, being told to go off and be innovative and then the board going, oh, why are we doing this? You need someone at the table who actually understands this. I put up one deliberate slide in every one of my talks. I call it the scary slide. It's basically got about 25 buzzwords on it, and I let it build slowly. Some are really easy, 5G, IoT. Some are a bit harder, sovereign identity. And I use that again as a bit of a PSA. I say, if you don't know what all these things mean, two things, either go home tonight, play Wikipedia bingo, look at what they mean and what they mean for your company, or ask a young person and then they'll laugh. But I, I, I'm really keen on this, that the notion of digital diversity, that every single um, part of the organization has to make a decision, needs to understand what they're deciding. And so if they're not being innovative, I, I, in fact, I'll give you an example, which roll back to your shortage example. There was a well-known bank who decided to be innovative and they sent 200 people to a WeWork. Sounds great on paper. And I thought, what a great idea. You're getting them out of the, the big central bank. They're able to think um, collaboratively actually gave this example at another company and the person in the audience had worked in the real estate team and they told me the real story. It didn't work because they couldn't print. They actually couldn't print locally because of the bank security. They couldn't print on a WeWork printer. They had to go back to the bank to print something out. So it all failed. And I thought, it just blew my mind. They did it for the right reason, yet there were so many controls in place that they couldn't even print a document where they were. And so I think what we need is a rethink about why we're doing this. And and we could talk about the whole notion of digital transformation. There's digitization where you're basically taking processes that were manual and we're making them digital. But when you do a digital transformation, it's not just about the technology. It's about the culture. And where I think digital transformation programs fail is that the employees, the partners, the, um, the people that are invested in this don't understand why they're changing. And so you've actually got to, yes, lift and shift for the technology, but along the way, explain why we're doing this. Why are we actually digitizing? Why, why are we using e-signatures? Now, five years ago, it was a lot harder for me to get people to say, hey, you should have a, an e-doc or an e-signature solution rather than moving paper around. The pandemic hit. You physically couldn't get a boss to sign a piece of paper. So guess what? All these e-signature programs came out of nowhere. Oh, what a great idea. They've only been around for 20 years. And so that, for me, is digitization. But then the whole transformation of now that we've done that, we are now going to basically use e-approvals. And so it should be so simple that what you're approving is an exception rather than the norm. If it doesn't, um, if it meets the criteria, it goes through the system until there's an exception when you need a human. So long with an answer to your question, but I agree with you. That people are not getting out of the way. Now, is this generational? All of our Gen Y, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, Gen Betas out there will go, why are we doing it this way? Um, they're now getting to the point where they're early to late 30s. They're probably in um, middle to senior management. Soon they will be in the C-suite and they will be on the board. And they're going to say, why the heck have we always done it this way? We're going to do it the right way. So interesting. So even from a purely generational point of view, you see that things are essentially going to change because people who've grown up using Revolut and Mondo and Monzo and Snapchat are not prepared to, you know, use the legacy systems of, well, I'm going to say NetWest and Boots because they are terrible. And um, I often see the job title, Chief Digital Officer or Chief Data Officer, and those are fairly new job titles because they're new jobs. And I've also noticed that people come to those jobs through very different backgrounds. Some are software engineers, some are marketers. So it's a, it's a diverse sort of set of people. With this chief digital officer, chief data officer, 
first of all, do you see that as a job that's going to last? Or is it just going to be, you know, is digital such a part of just running a company now that having a chief digital officer as a separate entity is not going to make sense? Let's cover that. I agree with you. My view is that these roles are transitional, that they have been created because there was a gap between the chief information or chief technical officer and the chief marketing or chief strategy officer. And over time, we're going to have to have people with all those skills. In fact, one of my podcast guests, Lauren Walker, who uh, worked with me at IBM, she's now at Accenture, she was at Dentsu before. When she was the chief digital officer at Dentsu, I had her on the podcast and she said, I created this role to make it obsolete. It's needed right now, but eventually we're going to have to ensure the people that we have doing these technical roles have a strong appreciation of the business. And people in business roles have a strong appreciation of technology. Time after time, my podcast guests are saying every company out there is a technology company. They rely on technology. And to your point before about, you know, is it a generational thing because these banks uh, don't do it in, in the right way? Um, Think about the customers. The customers are demanding the Amazon Netflix experience. They go home and they can just push a button and it works. And then they ask, why don't our systems work like that? And I challenge my audiences, get a friend or family member to try and buy something from your company. And if there's friction, then you need to fix that because you're not going to see it. You're going to know the way around it. Whereas someone buying it from scratch, you think about it. The last time you got a mobile phone, I guarantee it didn't have an instruction manual in there. I'm old enough to remember getting a Nokia phone. The instruction manuals were 10 inches thick with screenshots about how to send an SMS. We don't need that anymore. So we just need to make things easy and remove the friction. And part of that is the transformation because that's what our customers want. The pandemic, the the one good thing to come out of it is it's accelerated people's need for digital. Back to my example of my mom in, in Adelaide, Australia. She never had any desire to buy things online, do online shopping. She liked going to the shop. Fast forward to the pandemic, she couldn't. She had to learn how to use the online systems and she's a wizard at it and she doesn't want to go back to it anymore because it's really easy for her. So we've now got a whole population of people my mum's age and Gen Y, Z, Beta and Alpha who are saying, I just want it to work. And I think we actually might see the rise of the mega apps and the mega subscriptions. My old employer, Optus, back in Australia, has the mega sub option where you have one subscription, which includes Netflix, includes Amazon, all these other things. I think we're, we're overcomplicating our lives with so many apps on our phone. We're going to have the mega app that does it all for you. In fact, I talk in my talks about the digital assistant of the future. The digital assistant or digital agent will know everything about you because they know everything happening on your phone. And they will then start to make phone calls for you. They'll make appointments for you. They'll go on digital deals for you. I think we're going to have a very um, surprisingly good 20 or 30 years ahead of us because a lot of the minute we have to do today, you think about it, you know, re-insuring um, your car or your phone or those sort of things. Our devices know what's got to be done. I think we are going to be using technology for good uh, in a very short period of time. Yeah. One of the questions that my business school students ask me is, okay, well, when I graduate from business school, some, some of them want to work in tech companies, but quite a lot of them want to work in a big, traditional, well-known business going through digital transformation um, because you know they like the brand, they don't want to work in a tech company, but they want to work in the cool, innovative digital bit because, I mean, who doesn't want to work in the forward-looking part of the company? But being MBA students, a lot of them don't have backgrounds in engineering, don't have backgrounds in tech. So what would you say to that person? What does that person need to know? What do they need to do? What kind of network do they need to build? You know, you're thinking somebody is ambitious. They're probably you know, mid-30s. Let's tackle that one. And then let's tackle a slightly more senior person. What do they need to do? So the number one skill, I think, is is the business skill, knowing how to get a business case approved, knowing how to get a marketing campaign out there in the market. There are so many people that can actually help with the tech. So the whole premise of your podcast and, and your business is that there are non-techie people out there, and that's okay. I was asked a question by the students that I, I spoke to a few weeks ago, and someone said, you know, I'm not, I, am, I like the arts. Um, could I get a job in cybersecurity? Absolutely. There are, in every genre, roles for people that have a curious mind. So in cybersecurity, 
how do you think like a criminal? How do you think about someone who's doing social engineering? It's not about technology. It's about how the mind thinks and about psychology. So there are all sorts of ways that if you are not technically inclined or don't have a technical background, you can actually do that. Back to the example I gave at Optus and getting the business case approved. Remember, I'm a hybrid. Half of me is technology, half of me is business. Take away the tech side. I actually had a whole project team of people that could explain the technology. My skill was influencing Phil Jacobs, the chief operating officer of Optus, to spend $45 million on my project. And how I did it was boring old, going around and explaining to people why we should do this. It wasn't about technology. So yes, if you've, you've done an MBA and you've got those influencing skills, you can read a spreadsheet you can actually then top that up with a bit of knowledge. And, and I don't suggest you have to go and do a whole cybersecurity course, but I'm hearing more and more senior executives are doing top-up courses around cybersecurity, around cryptocurrency, just to understand the technology that is being thrown at them. If you're being asked to approve a £5 million cloud platform purchase, what do I need to know? Where are the servers? Where are they hosted? Is it uh, hybrid? Where's the metal? Who's doing the software updates? Uh, what's the security like? Questions like that actually affect the business outcome. So knowing a little bit about the jargon being thrown at you can be incredibly powerful without being a tech expert. So when you are then dealing with the C-suite, obviously the job of the CEO is to focus on the revenue. And if you've got investors, which a lot of them do, is... You know, investor reporting and um, earnings per share and all of that jazz. But at the same time, you need to stay up to date with tech trends. So what's realistic for that person? Because you know, part of my audience are the young, ambitious, about to exit their MBA. But part of my audience are the C-suite executives who are like, okay, Sophia, great, I know there's all of this stuff, but realistically, I don't have a lot of time. So what are we going to say to that person? I got to ask this question on Saturday. I was very fortunate to interview Tiger, who was the CEO of Genpact, a uh, Fortune 500, 100,000 person company. It's a it's a top tier consulting firm. I actually, a bit of bragging here, I got to go to the Formula E Grand Prix uh, in London on the weekend and, and uh, see the cars go around and talk about Genpact's involvement. One of the questions I asked Tiger was just this. So how do you stay up to date when you're running a 100,000-person company and you've got investors and media and everything else? He said, I've really got into podcasts. He used to be listening to a couple of hours a week of podcasts. Now he listens to, I think he's up to 12 and 15 hours a week of podcasts. There are so many experts out there um, that the challenge is to find the right podcast. And obviously, your podcast and my podcast are excellent. But how can you actually consume this information and upskill? And I think podcasts one way of doing it. The second thing is to read, um, not necessarily read the very, very technical um, website. So there's Wired and, and TechCrunch and those things. They're great for techies like me. But even the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the FT, they have very strong technical pieces that also have a business element. There's one um, I would recommend. There's a website called The Information. They do a great job. They're based on the West Coast of America, and they basically have a business and a tech, um, a tech hybrid. The Economist is another great area uh, where you can learn that. So there's so much to learn. You've got to set aside the time, though. You've got to actually invest time. So what Tiger's doing, he's spending 15 hours a week. Now, what, where is he when he's doing that? He's out for a run. He's doing a walk. He's in the car. He's using that downtime to to constantly be learning. And he, has, he calls himself a lifelong learner. So short answer to your question, you need to be digitally curious. You need to be curious about the world around you and satisfy that curiosity with experts who can educate and uh, inspire you. Well, this is a really, really wonderful note to end on. And before we go, could you tell us where people could keep up with you? It's really easy. Just search for The Actionable Futurist. Uh, the Actionable Futurist or actionablefuturist.com. Well, that was very useful. And if you are loving what you're learning in the podcast, then definitely apply to the Tech for Non Techies program. I've taught it at London Business School, at the Blackstone Tech Stars Launchpad, I've taught it to Oxford University's Executive MBA class, and to many other elite organizations. Non-technical professionals have used the program to invest in tech startups, to succeed in tech businesses, to build companies as non-technical founders, and to transform their careers. And if that's what you want, then fill out the application form in the show notes. So 
we can talk through your goals and your options. And if you work in a corporate that wants to increase productivity and diversity and innovation, because who doesn't, then get in touch in the details in the show notes, because this is what narrowing the gap between your tech teams and your non-tech teams does. And remember, as Benjamin Franklin told us, an investment and education pays the best dividend. On that note, thank you very much for lending me your ears for this episode and continuing to learn from me. I really, really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day and I'll be back in your delightful smart ears next week. Ciao.